I was interested in coming to UC Berkeley. Um, well, I wasn't originally interested in coming to UC Berkeley specifically. I think in the beginning it was more an interest in leaving Germany and leaving Munich more specifically because it felt like a very, a very beautiful and a very prosperous bubble, but it felt like a bubble and I didn't really have any dreams regarding like or like any dreams of myself living in that bubble um, in the future. So I started applying to colleges in the United States, but UC Berkeley was actually the only one on the West Coast and it was um, the first one I applied to interestingly, but I my original plan was to go to the East Coast. And then it was just a um, sort of spur of the moment decision to come to UC Berkeley, um, mostly because of its history. And my father um, had told me a lot about the free speech movement as I was growing up. So I think that was the reason why I came here. And it was a great decision. <laughs> so this research project um, thankfully gave me the opportunity to look at the documents and um, just basically the life stories of these scholars as they were and um, not in a sort of like pre-made framework as it often is the case and, and which is also good in um, undergraduate lectures in history because I think as you start thinking about history um, it's it's very important to to learn how to think in different frameworks so, um, so 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 it's good to pick them up but then also going like taking the next step and looking at documents that are in disarray that are in multiple archives, even at the UC Berkeley campus, there were some documents in the Bancroft Library, some in the Music Library, and I think we could have gone even further. Um, I mean, we know of different documents who are in Albany, in New York, so I think going like forward, um, these would be also be good to be included. Um, but it's sort of like starting to pick from these different places and trying to assemble a narrative was really instructive and really interesting. So doing research for this project was amazing, um, especially since um, the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley is beautiful. It has this golden sta staircase, and as you walk up, um, you're given these white gloves with, with which you can then go through the different archives. And I think what really struck me is that um, I think besides, for example, Max Knight, who had pre-assembled his own um, biography, or also Reinhard Bendix, or um, some other like exceptional scholars, most of these people hadn't dealt with their past. Um, on their own. So as I went through the different cartons that I um, looked at, for example, Gerson Goldhaber, there was no particular folder that said, for example, Europe, or no particular folder that um, talked about how they managed to come from Europe, from Central Europe to the United States, but rather those were very separate documents in between lecture notes, for example, or on the back of a dinner menu. And so kind of really like sifting through this just vast array of, of stuff that everyone accumulates as, as we live, right? Um, and like finding sort of like little pieces of history among this everyday stuff, I think was amazing. In the spring of 2013, we held a public event where the undergraduate researchers, um, faculty from UC Berkeley, the curator and um, the public all came together and looked at the progress we had made to this point on the project. Um, and I thought it was particularly remarkable because oftentimes, because the history we looked at was in a lot of ways very, very recent um, compared to other topics. So it was amazing to see basically the different, um, to see the documents come to life. I, I remember um, we had sort of a, a wrap-up session in the very, at the very end of the event. And there was one man in particular who came up and he was, an, he had been an emigre, or like he was an emigre, he is an emigre. Um, and so he started talking about his own life, um, speaking about the sources we had come up with, and I think getting that feedback um, contributed another dimension to what we already had on paper. So I think a lot of times as you do historical research, you have papers, you have words, you have photographs increasingly, and then also um, television on tape. But just also hearing from people who look back on their own history really added so for the curatorial work for this exhibition, um, I think it was remarkable how as you prepare for an exhibition, different from writing an academic paper, for example, you have to keep in mind that the person who will, will be viewing your work will not necessarily be an academic. And I think that's actually one of the great advantages of the work um, of this ex that this exhibition does, that it opens up a, um, a topic that's usually more confined to a set circle of people, to a broader audience, or at least gives it, it, it opens up the possibility of a greater reach. Um, and um, in terms of curating the documents, I think one thing that I found difficult was to see the documents with 
um, the viewer's eyes because after about five or six months working on these documents, they seemed very familiar to me and I knew the backstory of most of them. So then taking a step back and, and seeing the documents from a more distance from a more distant perspective was challenging, but also really re rewarding as, I mean, for me, I mean, I, ta I thought about this as sort of a, as, as artists, for example, produce a, a statue that, you know, you hammer away the different parts of the stone and like, as you do that, you arrive at a more perfect statue. So like hammering away all these like, not redundant documents, but documents that didn't exactly fit into the narrative that we were trying to produce, um, I think was a really sort of, it was a good exercise in focusing in on one aspect of a story. In the spring of 2013, me and my cohort of undergraduate students went into the archives at UC Berkeley, the Bancroft Library and the Music Library at UC Berkeley as well, and unearthed about 400 to 450 documents um, by, well, basically pertaining to the lives of these refugee scholars. Without, and as we went into the archives, we didn't really have, we didn't have a pre-made narrative that we were looking for. And I think it was interesting because a lot of researchers actually went into the archives not knowing much about the lives of these scholars. So these, these documents kind of existed in, in a vacuum almost. And then as we brought them together at our weekly meetings, we started constructing or like started thinking about the context these documents stood in. So many of the scholars who came to UC Berkeley preserved documents about their lives in Europe. And one document that stands out to me is a photo of, of a family next to a river and it's very stereotypical German romantic landscape with the river flowing down from a, a hill and sort of like a dark forest to the right and to the left. And you can just see that it was a very different world than the United States that they came to in the 1930s and 40s. And I think just like these photos, and I think in, in this context about the old world in Europe, photos were probably the most interesting documents that we found because they illustrated the, how, how different the, this world was. It was probably more, for some of the people in Eastern Europe, more rural where they came from. And just the way people dressed, the, um, the children looked much more mature or like too mature for their age almost. And I think pointed to the hardships that they went through early on. Um, and then I think connecting that to once they were in UC, at UC Berkeley, for example, we found one letter from a family in East Germany who begged one of the scholars who came to UC Berkeley to take care of her child. And she basically wanted to send her child from East Berlin to Berkeley. And this letter also had this photo of this East German boy. And it was striking, I think, how much this East German boy resembled some of the childhood photos of, of the scholars we found. Um, sort of like showing I think also to the difference between the political systems like whether you live in an authoritarian system whether you have enough to eat and then being in Berkeley I think made a huge it's just a very I don't know har harsh rupture I think so as I and the other undergraduate researchers went into the archives at UC Berkeley we saw that they had brought documents from the old world um, which was not old at the time, but which seemed old from our perspective, um, which was at the time just East and Central Europe. And they had brought documents from that world to their new homes at UC Berkeley. So as we went through the archives, we also saw, we, we saw the need to address the question how these scholars came from Europe to the United States, because there seemed to be a gap between being a scholar in Europe and then working at UC Berkeley. And so what we discovered is that they had quite dramatic refugee stories. For example, one scholar went through Shanghai to then come to the United States. Others took the much more common route um, over the Atlantic Ocean. And, but what all these stories had in common, or a lot of them had in common, was the presence of helpers, of people who were already in the United States, who, had, who were reasonably powerful or had a position that allowed them to help the people in Germany, in Poland, in Austria to come to the United States. And I think probably, well, perhaps as important as the agency and the decision, and I think the, the decision to leave Europe on the part of our emigre scholars was also the presence of these benevolent people in Berkeley and in, at the University of Chicago and so on. So as we went into the archives, we expected to find impressive, an impressive record of their professional achievements at UC Berkeley because they, after all, they had managed the transition from Europe to US academia. 
But what, we, what surprised us was how very much in instrumental they had been in shaping UC Berkeley institutionally. For example, the molecular cell biology department was co-funded by Gunter Stent and there are other examples as well, but it really showed how they brought their academic tradition to the United States and to Berkeley specifically. It was interesting to see how these scholars related to their past after having lived at UC Berkeley for um, a considerable am amount of time because there's not one story of looking back and pondering um, where they were from. For example, some people like Alfred Einstein completely broke with their European past and for example rejected um, honors from Europe, whereas others looked back and tried to help um, refugees at new refugees in Europe, for example, refugees, Jewish intellectuals in the Soviet Union. Um, so I think there is um, a mixture of different stories of relating back to their past and it just really shows how very much individual all these scholars were. I think something that other scholars of the subject or just visitors to this um, exhibition can learn from this is a sense of possibility and optimism because these people in the midst of political authoritarianism and threat to their lives just still found a way to realize their lives and yes they were the lucky few but they still show sort of the flip side of history they show that there's possibility and they also show that there is that there are always different ways of doing things against the norm. I think one moment that struck really deep with me is reading Albert Einstein's letters to Alfred Einstein who advised him to go to America while he was still in Italy because there's something very immediate about reading a person's handwriting. I think everybody knows Albert Einstein or has at least heard of him but then seeing that person's handwriting on on the back of a it was it was very much improvised it was an improvised addendum to a letter that was written on a typewriter so I think it was sort of it was a matter of chance that Albert Einstein wrote on the back of his letter but then seeing his handwriting very casually on the back of this letter was just showed how how much how much how, how very much improvised history is I think because we look at we look back at it and then it's determined and set in stone and it's word on the, words on a piece of paper but just like seeing sort of the spontaneity of the note was struck a chord. <laughs>